Okay, so we'll go ahead and start our question and answer session. So once again, you want to settle and uh, reconnect with your motivation. Okay, so what is it? It's morning, good morning. <laughs> um, the questions were great, I really appreciate them. Um, the questions today are touching on things, some of them that will take time to unpack. So that's a bit of a disclaimer. So I'll give you, you know, a short, sweet answer to sort of start working on, but some of them will need follow up and thinking and processing. So um, in the follow up email that I'll send you related to this retreat, I'll send you a link to the videos and uh, kind of a recommended reading list if you really like Mahamudra style meditation. And remember that uh, the text is also going to be taught at Tushita during July and August. Um, I also wanted to mention that uh, the treating sessions, which normally I come to and uh, find really interesting, I was able to send feedback in advance to Rahalis, but uh, for Smadar and Iran, um, I was a little late getting it there in time to read during the this, this session. So I apologize to you both, but it'll be in your email waiting for you when you get home. So uh, there's some feedback related to your treating session um, that you can look at if you're interested. So that's there. And um, in general, keep up the good work. Everyone does such cool stuff in their sessions. It's really fascinating. So thank you for sharing it with me. The first question was about could I elaborate about this phrase, the ultimate ego or ego grasping? And this is words that um, you'll hear people like uh, Yang Zirimbache will use this kind of phrasing. Lama Yeshi will use this kind of phrasing, sometimes Lama Zopa. This is um, the influence of hippies in the 70s coming to Nepal and staying at Kopan and teaching the monks English. So, um, you know, some of them were well-educated hippies that knew something about psychology in a basic way. And some early scholars of Tibetan Buddhism also chose words that had psychological parallels that seemed like the same ideas as in Buddhism, even though it's not a perfect fit, it was sort of close. So technically we would say things nowadays like self-grasping ignorance, right? But some of these older lamas um, or lamas that learned their English in this style will say, use the word ego. And sometimes I will too, just, you know, my dad's a therapist, right? <laughs> so what they mean is self-grasping ignorance, which is the root of samsara. So viewing the I in your own mental continuum and holding it to exist inherently. So it's not just the appearance of the inherent existent I, it's the grasping onto that. So when they say ego grasping, just hear self-grasping. When you hear ultimate ego, occasionally it's also kind of referring to the object of negation. So there's the grasping at the self, but then there's the object of that grasping, right? So the object of that grasping, the inherently existent self, that's the object of negation. Sometimes that can also be a connotation of phrases like ultimate ego. So it's not like equanimous to grandiose self. It's not equanimous to cosmic narcissism. It's not equanimous to those things in a perfect way. So don't, don't make too many parallels because it's not quite as tidy 
as it can sound. Um, people at Gyeongsi Rinpoche also like to play with English in a way to evoke experience. So lots of Geshis teach very concretely, very didactically in a way that um, the logic is very precise, the definitions are very precise, and that is really essential for making our minds very tidy and organized. And then we have other teachers who teach in a more experiential way and in a more inspirational way. And we need them also to feel uplifted and connected to the content in this experience near way. So, you know, as you continue on your path, I really recommend that you seek out teachers of both styles, those that are very scholastic and didactic and precise, as well as those who are very experiential and will play with the poetry and movement and experience of things, because those two styles of teaching come together within ourselves in a really beautiful way over time. But in the beginning, it can be confusing because they use words a little bit differently. So that was about ultimate ego and ego grasping. Um, the next question, uh, what does it mean about the wind element described or to connect to the wind element through nature? I'm guessing this is also referring to, to Yangzi Rinpoche's style of leading Mahamudra meditation. Um, if it's not, please clarify. But um, when they talk about wind, you know, they're talking about the inner energy system. So what you would call qi in Chinese medicine, right? Um, so not like air. Yeah, they're talking more in terms of movement. And it's that very subtle wind that the consciousness is always together with, like a horse and its rider. They're always together. For us during our lifetime, the consciousness and the wind it rides on, for the most part, stay within the body. Yeah, they're not, you know, jumping out. You, <clears throat> excuse me, usually. But when we die, then the consciousness leaves the body traveling on that subtle wind mind. So the invitation in these meditations is get your winds to settle down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because when you have anxiety, when you have agitation, then the subtle energy system gets very agitated and it's harder to think clearly. Yeah, there's a relationship between subtle body and coarse body. There's a relationship between body and mind. And so when we're talking wind element in Buddhism, normally it's referring to the subtle wind energy within the body. So... Here were those questions. Um, then there was one about, can I please repeat, what is observing the observation? Um, is there an application in daily life? And I mean, in a simple way, it's just mindfulness in a simple way. Yeah. What, what I'm kind of, you know, pushing us to go further with is to not just observe the thoughts without reactivity, but to observe the fact that you're observing the thoughts without reactivity. Yeah. So it's not just the observation, it's awareness of the observer. Yeah. And, and the point of that is the more you can kind of reconnect to the natural spaciousness within the mind, the more options you have in your daily life to make skillful choices. The more agitated the mind is, the more instinctual and immediate your reactions are. Sometimes they're good and useful anyway, you know, and it's not the end of the world, but a spacious mind has more possibilities. It has more options. And so in daily life, it's directly applicable. If you can maintain somewhat of an observer stance, which is not a dissociative stance, but is a little bit objective about your own experience and has the mindfulness to check, have I forgotten bodhicitta or not? And then gently nudges bodhicitta back into the main motivation whenever it notices that it's fallen off track. Yeah. Okay, so then um, 
I got sent a, a picture of a question um, whose handwriting will just take me a second to process, but it's um, a good question, I think. Uh, I get confused with my thoughts. I had two images uh, of the mind. One was a transparent mother that every moment of mind is going through her and embraces everything with no judgment. The other was a higher than everything is passing, a highway that everything is passing through it. But when I tried to think of their empty nature, that the mother doesn't exist, excuse me, without the children that go through her, the highway doesn't exist without cars driving on it. It came back to grasping at a concrete form of highways and mothers from their own side, like existing from their own side. So, you know, the, the imagery and the metaphors and the impressions that come to your mind are useful and interesting, but don't get lost in them. Yeah, it, it's again, it's a pointing. Don't get lost in the finger pointing. Look at what it's pointing to. So the mind is empty of inherent existence. The mother is the spacious potentiality from which all things arise. This is an interesting imagery that can give us a sense of what emptiness means. You know, if you think in terms of womb, a womb is space. You know, there's space in a womb that has potential for a baby. That makes sense to us. We're human beings, we're mammals, we understand science. Lots of us have children. It makes sense to us but then don't get trapped there. Yeah, because really we're trying to recognize our self as the mother, the emptiness of the self. And when we're looking at the emptiness of the self, we have to find the object of negation. The object of negation is that feeling of concreteness of when you start to centralize or solidify or make things too literal. Yeah, so when you feel yourself making things too literal, know that to be part of the symptoms of an object of negation that must be recognized. So in the beginning, the work that you do already is going in the direction of understanding the context of people and why people don't exist as independent entities arising in and of themselves. You know, a lot of the work you do is looking at family history and looking at societal context and looking at all of the things that come together to quote, make a person. And a lot of that unpacking is quite useful and quite necessary in terms of releasing trauma and releasing core suffering and understanding humanity and all the good stuff. But in Buddhism, that is very superficial and only the beginning. What we're trying to do is to find the object of negation even more deeply. So you ask yourself, where do you centralize identity that's more subtle than even all that surface history stuff? That's you know, much more subtle than race and gender and education and age and ethnicity and all those things, what is subtler than that? The mind is subtler than that. Yeah, so that's why we're looking at the mind so much as the object to look at the emptiness of. Yeah, and so that's what, and this ties into a different question, which is what is the kind of the main difference between Mahamudra meditation and regular emptiness meditation? Mahamudra meditation is using the mind specifically as the object that you're curious about the emptiness of. So the mind can appear to you as, in a way, the object of negation. It can feel like the mind is the self because that's a lot more subtle than our normal impression of self. So you might think, oh good, I finally got it. I found the self, the self is the mind. But no, the self is not the mind. The self is labeled on the mind and body. Yeah, so it's more subtle, right? So finding the mind is one thing. Finding that you identify with it as self is another thing. And then dispelling that is another layer also. Yeah, so don't get tra trapped in the metaphor. Use it as a, you know, a direction that it's pointing somewhere. 
Um, let's see. And then there was one more. Does the clear unknowing mind, the conventional mind, can it reflect the emptiness of the objects it meets? If not, what does it reflect? Generally speaking, the conventional mind reflects conventional objects, generally speaking. Yeah. To realize the ultimate nature of mind, you have to see the emptiness, the lack of inherently existent mind. Yeah. And, and that concept just needs some processing. Yeah, just, you just need to keep thinking about what does that mean? The clear and knowing mind, sky-like and spacious, or perhaps mirror-like, like a mountain lake is sometimes an analogy used. It reflects conventional objects, but it does not stand alone. It's not self-creating. It's not unitary. It's not permanent. You know, all of these things help us understand the way in which it's empty of inherent existence. When we realize its lack of inherent existence, the lack of appear, the lack of inherent existence, quote, appears, but it's a mere negation. It's a mere absence that doesn't imply anything in its place. So we can use the imagery of the clear light mind, the autumn dawn, you know, blue, right? If you want to make it a little concrete while you're in the beginning, think, okay, blue, right? Light blue. But don't get lost in that, right? Because the clear light mind having the appearance of an autumn dawn when it arises is not actually a fabricated experience when it actually happens at death. It's something that arises naturally, which then you bring your understanding of emptiness to. Yeah, but, but in the beginning, you know, you can kind of make it simple to move in the right direction. So I think that was it. Were there any other hanging ones? Hey, hi, Simona. I wanted to ask you if you can say a few more words about the gaps you spoke about, the, the moment, what, a, what exactly you intended. Um, I was busy with many things, but uh, with the difference between this open awareness and the self awareness of uh, looking at my own process, judging it. Uh, even uh, guiding it, you know, what, what is the difference between this open awareness which doesn't identify with itself and, and this self-awareness which guides, which looks? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a really important distinction. Yeah, thank you for that. And, you know, in, in English, do you feel... Do you feel the difference between the two English words, self-conscious and self-aware? Are those two words that you feel comfortable with the definition of self-conscious as opposed to self-aware? Is that a, yeah. So self-conscious, you know, the example of self-consciousness would be, you know, like a, a fragile teenager who's obsessed with their appearances and obsessed with what people think of them and they're thinking about themselves all the time. They are thinking about themselves all the time, but they're not self-aware, right? They're like, am I pretty? You know, and it's poignant and cute and we were all there once and sometimes are still there, but that's like self-conscious. And that's what we're trying to kind of shift away from our polite adult version of, in the first part of the meditation. So in the first part of the meditation, you just got your good old breath meditation and you can have different kinds of self-consciousnesses arise, cringing at memories, chasing good memories, building up a sense of here I am a good meditator, <laughs> whatever, you know, I self-consciousness feelings. 
And those might actually go quite quickly, given the people that we are and the work that we do. That might not be a huge project. Depends on the day. If you've just had an argument, it might be a really big challenge in the beginning. But then you move to kind of trying not to get lost in sensory stuff. You know, like there's a sound of kids playing in the pool and come back to the breath. And my knee hurts and come back to the breath. And, you know, you're, you're trying to kind of move from obsession with senses to touching them gently and not being concerned with them. You know, so in the beginning, it's just breath keeps you steady, different kind of reactivity, you still tempt your focus, but you're gently letting them go. Then the next step is becoming aware of just the thoughts. And as you become aware of the train of thought, sometimes they're verbal, sometimes they're nonverbal, sometimes they're in images or sounds, and sometimes it's kind of static, like static on the radio, you know, or it's just kind of a, you know, a quiet place without much chatter. But you're maintaining that attentiveness and that introspection that is awake to it. So when it's verbal, you notice verbal, you're not describing it or judging it or going on a whole story about it. You're just like, hmm, yep, yep. And so your self-consciousness in that way starts to be almost gone and your self-awareness is more and more heightened. You know, you might say to yourself, hmm, a bit agitated. You know, there was a million thoughts, but the conclusion you came to was hmm, a bit agitated today or all oh, quite calm today. You know, it, it's, it's quiet summary that might not even be a verbal summary. It's just kind of a, a noticing. And you kind of are in that non-reactive noticing, non-reactive noticing, non-reactive noticing. And that is probably the main skill set we should work on. And you already have been working on and you already do do, you know, so you're already getting proficient at that. It's this final step that I think is a little bit more ephemeral, which is to think, how do I maintain non-reactive awareness and maintain kind of a, an awake focus with even less concern of the contents and more connection with the ability to observe without like over explaining it to ourselves or over correcting or talking to ourselves too much about it? How do you just kind of release what you're seeing into the ability to see? So the experience of it that we're aiming for at our level really is just to stay awake, <laughs> you know, and to not, to not leave the present. So, you know, the, the challenges of this time are, you know, some conception is walking by your mind and you don't get drawn or the tendency to kind of fade into a dull relaxation. You know, that kind of space you can get into, especially if you're tired and you've done a lot of sessions where your mind is kind of spacious, but it's also kind of hazy and it has an edge of sleep. And afterwards, it feels like you need to kind of shake off some lethargy. You know, that's, that's one of the, the things that can happen. So what you're trying to maintain is just kind of a wakeful awareness, not too concerned about what you're aware of. Yeah. Expectations are very dangerous for me in this stage of quite dying expectations. For example, last time, what like that now, how was you? It's smooth. Yeah. It's obstacles are really tricky. Yeah, yeah. I mean, really, I do think that the, the ability you have with your patients to watch without reactivity, to listen without reactivity, it is the same skill. It's just doing it for yourself. And it's just trying to get it to subtler levels. His Holiness says that a really good time to kind of go straight to the clarity of mind without the inter, without the intro stages is like first thing when you wake up before you've started having too many words. And of course, if you're really stressed out the first time you wake up, you're immediately thinking of plans and worries and whatever. But if you can kind of go to sleep having put the day to bed properly, 
when you wake up, you might have that real spacious clarity and you can just sit up in bed, just stay in bed, don't even move, just sit up and just straight into clarity of mind. It can, it can actually be the best time. Yeah. Other other thoughts? Just to give uh, some some tinge of psychoanalytic history concerning this uh, observation, this mode of observing or this mode of uh, being. Uh, I already mentioned it uh, in the beginning. I think that the question of neutrality or the question of free floating attention. Some of the uh, phrasing that Freud uh, posited uh, for civilization and for psychoanalysis uh, are kind of uh, an attempt to, to get to such uh, such modes of uh, being. But I think that uh, we should uh, understand that the awake mind is an engaged mind. It's a very, very active, very vivid, uh, engaged mind and not a neutral mind. And in this, in this sense, uh, uh, I was asked in several, uh, several uh, questions concerning the relationship between empathy, between uh, our uh, innovations that we have uh, inserted into this uh, notion uh, during the last decade. Uh, to the Mahamudra, I think that we should elaborate this connection, this linkages, and I hope that after this retreat we will be nourished uh, with uh, much more resources to, to uh, deepen our understanding of the empathetic sense. I think that the, what Kurt called and uh, defined as the micro units of the self object self uh, circles is a kind of this getting into the more subtlest, uh, more subtle layers of contextuality. Contextuality doesn't mean only factual uh, scenes and events and figures that uh, were woven uh, into my life. But what we are doing in the transferential uh, field, in the transferential space, in the uh, analytic session, so it's consisted of many, many, many circles, many, many uh, little circles, which called called, called micro unit of uh, mental states, and this is a circularity of self object self, uh, which are going on and on and on. And I can I can uh, really uh, think of what uh, we can uh, take out of this uh, retreat. Uh, one of the things, one of the treasures that we can take out of these days is the ability to, to deepen these uh, circles and this, uh, the resolutions that we can uh, deepen our inquiry into these uh, circles of, of contextuality of mind, of very uh, minute uh, contextualities. And I guess I had one, you know, follow up thought about that, which is when you're doing this work, you know, you've both been analyst and analysand, right? You, you know, both ways of being. And in the meditation, it's almost as if you become both at the same time, that you're your own analyst and you're your own analysand at the same time. So you're able to have that freedom of flow with your thoughts and the neutral but active yeah and you know neutral i think it is, is a tricky word because it's not a completely neutral stance it's a, it's a very active observer that isn't indifferent to what's happening right so it's not neutral in the sense of indifferent it's neutral in the sense of equanimous and so you're allowing your mind to do what it does and you're allowing your mind to engage with the watching or the very deep listening of what it does. So maybe in the beginning, you're more your own analysant, and then you become more and more just your analyst. And then you're more just analyst without analysant, like the couch 
empties, even though it doesn't, but you're maintaining that kind of bright, active mind that you have with deep listening. Yeah, how you are with very deep listening. You're listening not in order to hear something specific. It's the quality of listening. One of my friends says, you give your object of meditation your interest. Give it your interest. You know, there's reading the newspaper with interest and there's reading the newspaper without interest. You can be reading it in both cases, but how awake to it are you? Anyway, other thoughts? No, please. Hey, welcome. Thank you. Uh, it's a bit uh, difficult to organize this question, but I think it connects to what's been talking right now. Um, it's it's a thoughts I had in the meditation, I think two days ago or yesterday. Time isn't very uh, concrete and uh, civil. <coughs> Um, and I had this um, um, mind and emptiness when I was doing what's, what I was supposed to do in meditation, what I think I was supposed to do, and um, suddenly I had an idea that was connected to, to a mission I have in another place. It's not connected to work or what we're doing here. It is connected, it's more far. And um, I know it's not the purpose of the exercise, but still something has arisen. Something about being with the emptiness has bought um, this thing and I associated with, the, I think it was Michelangelo saying that he, um, he didn't sculpt the view. He, um, he lets, he lets revealed. So there's, I think we're dealing with something between, um, it's, I don't know if it's the linear and the quantic or is it the relationship between time and space? as we saw, I think, especially with Owen, uh, that um, we can drive 20 uh, miles an hour or 200 miles an hour and we're doing something else or um, existing in another way, the existence. Depends how we're driving and in what kind of awareness. So I don't know exactly the question, but the, it's something about um, letting go, like the blue you were talking about before, and something about there's me and not me, which is not nothing or something. It's the closest as the next as the question I can ask. Well, you know, I think the only thing I can really speak to, because you're describing deep and personal experiences, is to say that it sounds like you're engaging with the material in a way that is personal and direct, and that is the main thing. Yeah. So it sounds like you're doing a process that is deeply useful and meaningful, and that you're bringing this new knowledge and this new wisdom and these new ideas to your pre-existing wisdom and your pre-existing experience and you're seeing how they marry together and it sounds like the process is is going in a good way but the specifics i'm not sure if i can comment on <laughs> but it sounds like it's going in a good way and and the fact that you're kind of actively engaging with life stuff together with the content of the topic is excellent and that's what we really want to be doing yeah so i don't know as as you were talking did you kind of feel like you could find what is the what is the question or the wondering in amongst those impressions or is it still brewing <laughs> yeah 
we get just wants um, to grasp on something or benefit something um, to progress it. And I understand that. I'll use my patience. <laughs> Thank you. It, it takes a long time to be clear about what even the question is, I think, and uh, to maintain a discipline that can be comfortable with an open question is something for all of us to, to hold the question or keep returning to a question because it's that very openness that keeps you from making concrete the habit of concreteness. So that very thing of, you know, hold open the question is a great mentality for life anyway. So anyway, <laughs> yeah. thank you. Oh, it's not. <laughs> Hi, Anton. Hey. First of all, we miss you tremendously. Your physical appearance here. Um, I wanted thinking about the last meditation, which was um, fascinating. Um, I was thinking about when you talked about the personal continuum of the karma, and it immediately took me to uh, a duality feeling. And so I thought about the emptiness, where is it? It's like the personal continuum is so vivid. So I thought maybe it's underneath it, but maybe you can elaborate about it. Yeah, it's, it, it's, that, uh, it's that razor's edge that we talk about a lot. Um, it came up with cohort two right towards the end of the semester. Iris was pointing to that kind of idea as well of how can we understand emptiness and understand karmic cause and effect within a personal continuum? How can you hold the two things? You know, to see that they're complementary ideas not contradictory ideas. And so if you can picture it like, for me, you know, I think in images a lot of the time and for me to think of the mental continuum as a river, it's an individual river with an individual name. The river changes names sometimes when it goes from country to country, but it's still the continuity of water. But to say that it is inherently existent river doesn't make sense because everything about it is in constant change. And so many things influence it. You know, the quality of the, the earth and the quality of the rocks and the quality of the contaminants and all sorts of things influence it. So it's like when we're looking at, for example, positive karma, we think, okay, arriving here was a positive beneficial action which will lead to happiness in the future. So I have some sense of it living here, that karmic seed, that potentiality, but I don't have a sense of it being mine in the sense of I made it all by myself. So, so you're having this like feeling of things coming together and landing, not a sense of I am creating things and sending them out, yeah? So it's like things are happening in this space and there is still free will conventionally and intention is the hugest component of this whole karmic story. But any intention you make, you don't make alone. You know, so it's like still, it's, it's like, here are the series of events that have landed here. We shall call them Yintin, you know. There's time for two more questions. Request for guidance, please, Ishan. <laughs> or um, any impressions about uh, Roger's style or Yangzi Rinpoche's style, uh, welcome as well. Hi. Hi. Hey. Two quick questions. One, uh, if you can think about uh, 
mind is pure awareness. Um, second, so if we live in a real virtual reality, let's say it's, and emptiness is not planning out, at least the electricity, yes, I want to just understand it. Uh, it's not, uh, it's, there is still reality. This is the understanding that it's virtual. I don't take the, um, the, the, I don't delete or take off the reality, in the, even if it's virtual. Just about the very awareness, about virtual reality, what emptiness. Uh, how can I, I understand it? Steps. Yeah, yeah, the good thoughts. Um, you know, it, it's not like the barren awareness happens and then the mental factors happen, like alternating back and forth. They're happening at the same time. So there, there's the, the, you know, the bare awareness and there is the mental factors, there is the sky and there is the clouds all the time. And what we're trying to do is kind of educate the clouds to have a better relationship with the sky <laughs> and to color the sky in more and more health and to allow the fact of its expansive ability and its calm and its contented ability to reassert itself. And then from that place, development and transformation and all these other qualities. So it's like, if you can view you know, conventional reality, you know, relationships and choices and plans and the things you see and what you do, if you can view it through the gaze of, I can both be engaged and reflective simultaneously. So I am detached, but I'm not disengaged. I'm fully engaged in life. I am fully invested in my life, but I have detachment from it. You know, I'm not, not believing the whole story of my life that I tell myself. This means this chapter I'm the hero and this chapter I'm the villain. And you know, you're not believing the story of your life, but you're still fully engaged with it. Yeah. Follow up question or? <laughs> Good. Okay. Last one, please. Is it Smadar's elbow? Yes, there. <laughs> it's a going to the right. I have a question about the the quote, I think it was from the His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, that you read us about the parts and wholesome. There is no such thing as wholesome without parts and part without wholesome. And I wanted to ask, is an enlightened mind a wholesome thing? Is there a wholesome thing when there is no karma and no affliction? Because I think about uh, psychoanalysis, self-psychoanalysis, uh, I think that as we work, nurse the wound, many splits uh, become more and more wholesome. The cell becomes more and more wholesome without vertical and horizontal splits. So I wanted to, to understand. Do you mean whole as opposed to wholesome? Wholesome means like uh, healthy and virtuous, oh. whereas oh. whole means complete. Whole. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. yeah. And when we say there is no parts without a whole and no whole without a parts, what we're saying is you can't refer to a concept of something being one th a whole of something unless you have parts of that. And to say something is parts of a whole, there have to be parts, like they're mutually dependent is what's being said. There's a mutual dependency. So for there to be, I don't know, an integrated person, you know, or a kind of more complete person or a more whole person or holistic person, 
there is acknowledgement of all of the facets, all of the pieces, all of the parts, having some sort of internal harmony, right? So conventionally. So then for a Buddha, a Buddha, you know, they, they were a sentient being, they have a history, they have a series of events and then ripened their mind to its perfected state. And the Buddha's mind is whole in the sense of abides in happiness and abides in compassion without any dissonance or lack of harmony, but it still can direct, direct itself here or there to the specific needs of individuals. So yeah, I'm not sure if I, I'm not sure if I understand the, the question. Do you want to ask again? What, what is the idea you're curious about with Buddhas? It's more thinking about psychoanalysis based dharma. Mm -hmm. Holding the pressure, pressures that there is no inherent self mm -hmm. and simultaneously looking for a place where the self can be more whole without splits, yeah. without parts, not horizontal, not vertical, in, in motion, in changing in motion, but mm -hmm. more whole and completely not splitting. Yeah, yeah, no, I think I'm with you now. And, and I think that, that that is the offering psychoanalysis can make to Buddhist communities. Because if we go straight to the philosophical view of the self and identity being empty of inherent existence without acknowledging all of the pain and trauma and impact those things have had on our life, we're skipping an essential step and we can often go into psychosis. So Jetsuma Tenzin Palmo often says, you need a very healthy, complete sense of self, a very grounded, integrated kind of ego, and then you break it apart. And if you jump over the step, you're not gonna have a healthy process of spiritual transformation. You're gonna have a traumatic process of spiritual trans transformation. And so you know, my feeling is you have to, yeah, come to wholeness, integrate the vertical splits, integrate the horizontal splits, get yourself all tidied up and then see that none of it existed from its own side. For a certain kind of individual, seeing that none of it exists from its own side can be part of feeling whole, you know? But it really depends on the individual. For some people, they really need to make things concrete and explain themselves to themselves in a way that feels tangible. You know, I am impatient because of this, and I am patient because of that, and I have an open heart here and an inefficiency there, and because, 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 and they have to land on the reason to feel secure. For other people, realizing that there are so many reasons to point to any one as the main thing would be an exaggeration. For those kind of people, the teachings on emptiness are very freeing and their identity as a victim can just dissolve. So I think it's up to you as an analyst to hear which way their wisdom is ripening and to somehow give energy to the positive momentum they're already creating you know, without kind of having your agenda of, well, for me, healing looked like this. So for them, it'll look like this, you know, just being present enough to see which approach is going to resonate best with them. I try to understand that it's, it's a very uh, first understanding this retreat when I'm saying, don't split between the self and the self the, um, the real self. So I'm trying to um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Ronan, did you want to speak to that? No, I think that we have uh, finalized the question and answer slot.